Welcome to the physics class for <clears throat> November the 12th. Uh, before we get started, let's just talk over a few administrative announcements. Okay, so first off, don't forget that the test rework is due this coming Saturday at midnight. Uh, you have to do all of the questions, even the ones that you got right. You need to go back and do them all again. Uh, uh, also, the, uh, the quizzes uh, that we've taken so far, the quiz 6A, uh, I unlocked that the other day, so you can go back and retake that as many times as you want. And uh, I just uh, just now, just this minute, unlocked quiz 6B. So you can now go back and redo that one as many times as you want. But remember, now that the deadline has passed, the best you can hope for now is to get a 9 out of a 10 on those. Uh, and I have to do that in order to encourage you to take the quizzes on time which you are doing better this, uh, this term than you did last term. You are doing better about that. Um, also, on quiz 6b, I was very pleasantly uh, surprised by how many people tried the extra credit problem and got it right. That was uh, very encouraging to see that. That was good. Um, OK, also, uh, tomorrow, Friday, um, I will not be available to do a, uh, a tutoring session, but I have made arrangements to have somebody cover for me. I've asked two of the AIM students who are in the U of U physics class if they would be willing to help out, and they said yes, and, but they can't do it during the same time that I normally do it on Fridays. So uh, tomorrow, Friday, from 11 in the morning until 12.30, uh, there will be one student, Ellie Till, uh, who will be available online to help uh, help answer any questions you have. So that's tomorrow, Friday, from 11 until 12:30, uh, and then also on Saturday, uh, if you would like to uh, get some study, some help. Uh, another one of the uh, AIM students in the U of U physics class, that's Yazan Iza, is going to be online from one o'clock until 2.30. Now they're both going to be using this Zoom room, the same room, Zoom, same Zoom room that you are in right now. Uh, so when you log on, you'll see my name, but you'll hear their voices. Uh, and Ames uh, is paying them to do this. Uh, the, the reason I arranged this is because, you know, a while back I asked you guys to form your own little uh, Zoom uh, study groups. And I heard back from several students saying that uh, they were having trouble hooking up with other uh, students in order to do this. And so I said, okay. And I convinced uh, Principal Wilson to pay these, uh, these two uh, U of U students to, uh, to help you out. But here's the catch. He's only going to do this if you guys take advantage of this. If, uh, if you guys don't log in to the, uh, the study sessions, then Principal Wilson's not going to continue paying these students to be there to help you. So you take advantage of it, use it or lose it, okay? So Friday from 11 until 12.30 or Saturday from 1 o'clock until 2.30, right here in the same Zoom room that you're in right now, okay? And then let's see, the last thing is just don't forget about Engineering Day on November the 21st. Uh, that is available as extra credit. And even if it wasn't extra credit, you should still do it. It's a really cool thing. Um, okay. Any questions about any of that? Not seeing any, not hearing any. Okay. What's the time for Saturday? Saturday is from 1 o'clock until 2.30. Thank you. You bet. All right, so let's now talk about last night's homework. Here are the problems to, or here are the answers to the three problems that I gave you. Um, and we, we're not gonna have time to talk about all three of them, probably only one of them. Uh, so let's do the same thing we usually do. Please type into the chat box, if you could only see one problem worked through. What is the one? Okay, so I'm seeing 79, 80. Looks like most people are going for 79. Oh yeah, okay. Uh, 80 is getting a few votes too, but 79 seems to be the clear winner. Okay, so let's go for 79. 
let me open up a, uh, a screenshot, or I'm uh, sorry, open up a whiteboard. Uh, okay, so 79, that was the one about the banked road. Okay, all right, so let me uh, first recommend that you do two drawings in order to better understand what's going on here. The first drawing, I, I'm going to call that a top view. And so the idea there is assume that you are in a helicopter up above looking down. So here is the curved road. We know the radius of curvature and uh, the, the car is moving at some velocity V. All right. And the velocity vector is always going to be tangential to the circle. Uh, okay, and then also I recommend that you do what I call a rear view. And the idea here is that you're in a car behind the car of interest. And so now when we did this problem before, uh, or when we did a problem similar to this before, what we had was the, the car was on a flat road and it was going around the, uh, the circle really fast. And we were worried that it would be going so fast that it would skid off the road, that the friction wouldn't be enough to keep it on the road. So let me start by drawing a picture of that problem, even though that's not the problem we're doing right now. I think it's helpful to just kind of review that for a bit. Okay, so when we did that problem before, it was on a flat road. That's not a very flat line, is it? Let's see if I can do a little better line there. Okay. Yeah, okay, that'll do. All right, so the car was right here and here were the tires. All right, so uh, the car, let's suppose the car is right here. So it's turning to the left. Uh, let's do a free body diagram. So we got, uh, I like my forces to be fat pen, let's try that. Okay, so we've got MG going down. We've got the normal force going up. And when we were doing this other problem, not, not, the, not problem 79, but another problem in our last homework that was kind of sort of similar to it, the car was turning left. What was the force that was causing the car to the turn the left? Well, it was the friction force, uh, you know, the friction between the, the tires and the road. So that was the force of friction. So if we go back to our top view picture now, if the car is right here, there is a force that is keeping the car in a circular path. And so we call that centripetal force, but that doesn't really tell us the nature of the force. That just tells us what the direction of the force is. So I wanna know what the nature of that centripetal, centripetal force is. Well, if we look at our, our uh, drawing down here, we can see that the nature of the force, it's the, it's the friction force. So then we can come back here and we can say, okay, so the friction force is what's providing our centripetal acceleration. All right, now that was back before when the car was on a flat road. Now the car is not on a flat road anymore. So we need to change things. So let's just, let's just get rid of all this, okay? Now this time around what's happening is the car is on a, on a banked, road. Okay, so we've got this angle here, theta. And this time, we're, uh, we're assuming that there's so much ice on the road, and it's frictionless ice. So there is no friction uh, at, at play here. So now we know the car is moving in a circle. So we do still have this, oops, I want my forces to be, to be fat. Hang on a sec. Okay, so we do still have something is being our centripetal force. Uh, something is keeping the car moving in a circular motion, but there's no friction. So what is, what is our centripetal force this time? Okay, oh, the whiteboard isn't showing? Oh my goodness, all that time I've been talking and the whiteboard hasn't been showing, that's, that's not good. Okay, so thank you for pointing that out. Okay, so let me try this again. Is it showing now? Okay, good. Uh, that's really weird. Okay, so all that talking that I was just doing, you guys didn't see that. Let me go back and redo that really quickly because I think it's important that we talk about that. Uh, oops, let me just clear everything. Okay, 
So go back and redo what I just said. So when we did the problem, not, to, not the problem we're on right now, but the previous problem. So here's our top view from a helicopter looking down and the car is moving at a velocity that way. All right, and then here's our rear view. And I should probably label these, the rear view, and this is the top view. All right, so on the rear view, here's, here's the car and here are the tires. And so when we do our free body diagram on the rear view, we got mg going down, we got the normal force going up, and we've got the force of friction. That's what's that's what's providing our centripetal acceleration. So when we go back to our top view here, I put the arrow right here. So the 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 force that is that is acting as our centripetal force, the one that's 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 uh, creating centripetal acceleration, we can see is friction. Friction is the one that's doing the job. All right, now. The problem that we have right here, problem number 79, uh, we don't have any friction. The idea of the problem is that we're banking the road uh, and so that the car is still turning to the left here, but it's not friction that's doing it. So what is it that's doing it? Well, let's, uh, let's draw the picture. So here's the road and here's the, here's the angle theta there. And so the car is now sitting like this and so if we do our free body diagram, we still have in, oops, I'd like it to be fat there, hang on. All right, so we still have mg going down. The normal force this time is not going straight up. The normal force is going off at an angle, okay? And the problem statement says that it wants us to figure out what is the bank angle so that the car will, will not either slide up or slide down. The car will just keep on going in a perfect circle, even when there's absolutely no friction. All right, so then my question is, uh, the, up here at the top here, this, the, we know that something is keeping the car going in a circle, uh, but it, it can't be friction, so what is it? Well, if we look at our uh, picture down at the bottom, we, we've got this uh, force here, uh, one of those forces, the normal force or the uh, or the the uh, gravity force, one of them is uh, the funky force. So which one is it? So remember what we did before was had we had our coordinates, and when we had an object that was sliding down a ramp, I told you that we need to rotate the coordinates because here's the rule with coordinates: coordinates have to be aligned with the direction that we know the object is moving. So when the object was sliding down a ramp, we had to rotate our coordinates accordingly. But this time, if we do our job right, the object is not gonna be sliding down. The object is gonna be staying at that same height and is going in a horizontal circle. So rotating the coordinates now would be the wrong thing to do. We need to keep the coordinates like this because that is the way that the object will be moving if we do our job right. So let's go back to here, okay? So we're gonna keep our coordinates uh, horizontal and vertical. So the funky force is not mg this time, the funky force is the normal force. So if we break that up into its components, okay, so this guy here is gonna be fn times the cosine of theta. This guy right here is gonna be fn times the sine of theta. So now we don't need Fn anymore because we replaced him with his components. So now, which force is it that's acting as our centripetal force? Which, which force is it that keeps the car turning the left when there's no friction? It's this guy right here. It's Fn sine theta. So our centripetal force now is Fn times the sine of theta. So I can go ahead and label that in my upper drawing there. All right. So once you do the drawing like this, now it becomes easy. But if you hadn't done the drawing like this, then I can see you're gonna be stuck. All right, so let's take her from here now. We know we're gonna, we're gonna put everything into Newton's second law. So we're gonna say sigma f in the x direction equals the mass times the acceleration in the x direction. And we're probably gonna need to uh, do it in the y direction too. So while we're at it, let's do that. So sigma f in the y direction equals mass times acceleration in the y direction. All right, so in the x direction, what do we got? Well, I only see one force in the x direction. That's this force right, right here. 
Okay, that's the force in the x direction. So let's just put that there. So Fn times the sine of theta equals the mass times. Now, what is the acceleration in the x direction? Remember in the x direction, we're moving in a circular path at constant speed. By the way, we call that uniform circular motion. That's a term you need to know. So if you're undergoing uniform circular motion, even though you're going at constant speed, you are accelerating because your direction is changing. And so the acceleration in that case is V squared over R. All right. So now we want to uh, come up with an equation that's actually useful to us. And we got too many unknowns in there. So we're going to need another equation. And we anticipated that. So let's look in the y direction here. Uh, so in the y direction, let's see what have we got here. Uh, we've got Fn cos theta going up. So if we define the plus direction to be up, which is the way most people like to do it, that goes in with the plus sign. So we've got Fn times the cosine of theta. But we've also got mg going down. So we have to put that in with the minus sign, minus mg. So that equals mass times acceleration in the y direction. What is the acceleration in the y direction? Now, don't say v squared over r, because that is horizontal. In the y direction, well, the object's not moving in the y direction. Okay, It's going in a horizontal circle. It is not moving in the y direction. Therefore, the the y acceleration is zero, and zero times anything is zero, so this then equals zero. Okay, so now we have two equations, two unknowns. Now, some of you might say, well, we, wait a minute, we have three unknowns because we don't know the mass. Ah, don't worry, I'm thinking the mass is probably gonna cancel out, all right? Now, how do we solve this? Some of you might say, well, you know, last time we had two equations, two unknowns, we used the elimination method. Could we do that now? And the answer is no, because one of the variables here is inside a trig function. The elimination method doesn't work in cases like that. The elimination method has another name. It's also called linear combination. And that's probably a, a more useful name just because it reminds you that you can only use elimination method if you're dealing with, with linear equ equations. And if you've got trig functions, then it's not linear. So we're gonna have to use the substitution method, which is okay. I mean, the substitution method is not hard. Uh, so let's take this equation on the right here and let's, uh, let's solve that for Fn. Uh, so we take the mg over on the other side and we divide by cos theta. So I'm skipping a couple steps here. I hope you guys are good with that. So Fn equals mg divided by cosine theta. I skipped a couple algebra steps. You okay with that? Okay. All right, so now what I'm gonna do is wherever I see an Fn over here, I'm gonna replace it with a thing that I know Fn is equal to. So it's gonna give me mg divided by the cosine of theta times the sine of theta equals mv squared over r. We were hoping that the masses were gonna cancel out and it looks like our hopes came true. Got an m over there and an m over there. Life is good. And now we've got, we've got sine theta on top and a cosine theta on the bottom. Hopefully you guys remember that that's equal to the tangent of theta. So now we've got g times the tangent of theta equals v squared over r. And so there you go. There is the relationship between V and R and theta. Now in problem number 79, they, they tell you what V is. They tell you what R is. They don't tell you what G is, but you know what planet you're on. So you know what G is. So we have to solve for theta. So we, what we do then is bring, bring G over the other side. So we, so we divide both sides by G and then we take the inverse tangent. So then theta, equals the inverse tangent of v squared over r. That, that r looks like a v there. Let me, let me make my r look more like an r. Okay, over r times g. There you go. That is the equation that you need. And so when you plug in the numbers that they gave you, then you should come up with these answers right there. 
So for 35 miles an hour, which by the way, you can't put in 35, you have to put it in in standard physics units. So they tell you, so 35 miles an hour is the same thing as 15.7 meters per second. So, so put in 15.7 for V and put in the number they gave you for R. And so these are what you're gonna get. And then do the same thing at the higher speed and you get these angles, okay? Now these angles are really big angles. Uh, if you were to look at a road that's actually banked, they're never gonna be banked at this angle. I mean, that, this 48.9 degrees, holy cow, that is a really steep angle. You would be in trouble if uh, the city actually banked the roads at that angle. Because what do you do if you're driving along on a snowy day and traffic is going slower than the speed limit? Because you know, you know, if the speed limit is 45 and it's a snowy day, you don't wanna be going 45, you wanna be going slower. Okay, and also maybe the traffic in front of you is stopped for whatever reason. Maybe it's a red light or maybe there's just a traffic jam. Okay, so if you were on a snowy day and they really actually banked this angle at 48.9 degrees, you'd have troubles. You'd have a whole lot of cars going sliding down the road there. Okay, so they're not actually going to bank it at this angle, but they might bank it at, at some, you know, some smaller angle there. And banking it definitely helps so you can go around the, the curve faster. And on a racetrack, where you know they they know they're going to hold the the race on a day where the where the uh, there isn't ice, uh, you know they're never going to have a race on a day when there's ice on the road. So you know, on a racetrack, they they actually might bank the angle like this. Okay. All right. So there, hopefully, are the answers to seventy nine for you. Um, are you good? Any questions about seventy nine? I'm not seeing any, not hearing any. Okay, now problems 78 and 80 are very, very good problems. You need to know how to do them. We don't have time today to talk about them. So let me remind you that tomorrow from 11 until 1230, Ellie is going to be here on this in this Zoom room to help you. And then Saturday from one o'clock until 2.30, Yasin is going to be here to help you. Take advantage of it. If you don't use it, you're going to lose it. All right, so uh, I'm thinking let's move on to the new material now. All right, so we are going to start into chapter seven today. I anticipate we'll probably spend about a week and a half doing chapter seven. We'll, we'll kind of see how things go, but I'm anticipating about a week and a half. And then we're going to take our next test. And the test will cover mostly chapters six and seven, although in physics, I mean, everything we do today builds on what we did previously. So, so uh, some of the questions will require knowledge from chapters three, four, five. So it's a good idea to go back and review those as well. But plan on that about, a, about two weeks from now, we'll take a test, give or take a little bit. All right, so chapter seven deals with gravitation, which actually works very well with what we're doing right now. Because uh, if you think about it, let's say you've got the sun right here and here's some planet going around the sun. So it's kind of like uniform circular motion, okay? Uh, the planet is going in a circle or now if, if, if you uh, uh, had a good junior high school uh, science teacher, you probably know that they're not actually circles. They're actually what we call ellipses, which is something we're gonna talk about in just a minute. But most of them are pretty close to being a circle. And so we have a planet going around in, in a shape that's pretty close to being a good circle. And so what is it that's keeping it moving in a circle? There must be some force here that is uh, acting as a centripetal force. What is the nature of the force in this case? If it's a planet going around the sun, well, it's gravity, right? So it makes good sense that we talk about gravity at the same time as the stuff that we just finished talking about. Right. But uh, first, let's, uh, let's go back and uh, let's do some more flat earth stuff. Uh, so back at the very beginning of the school year, I told you guys I was a member of the Flat Earth Society, which by the way is not a lie. I actually am a member of the Flat Earth Society. Now that doesn't mean I think the earth is flat, but it's, it's a fun society to be a member of, okay? But you guys successfully proved to me 
that the earth is not flat. And you did it using, in, using observations that you yourself could do without leaving the state of Utah. So good for you. But there's something else that flat earthers believe that you have not yet disproven. Uh, and so let's, uh, let's talk about this. Not only do flat earthers believe that the earth is flat, but they also believe that the earth is the center of the universe. So when you look outside and you look at the sun and you see the sun moving, it looks like the sun is, is going around the earth. In fact, we even have a name for that. We call that the geocentric theory of the universe or the geocentric uh, model. Okay, so, so my friends of the Flat Earth Society uh, and I, wink, okay, believe that the earth is actually in the center here. And so what we have here is that the, the sun is going around the earth as are the stars. The stars are all going around the earth too. So that we believe that this, the earth is the center of everything. So this uh, phrase that you see up here, geocentric, oops, doesn't show up very well in yellow when I do it there. Here. Okay, so geo means earth, centric, obviously center. So the geocentric theory of the, uh, of the universe is that the earth is at the center. Now in uh, your junior high school class, uh, your, your teacher probably told you that it wasn't really like this. It's not really the sun going around the earth, it's actually the earth going around the sun. But let me give you the same challenge that I gave you before. I want you to prove it. Uh, I want you to prove that the geocentric theory of the universe is wrong. And you have to prove it using observations that you yourself could make without leaving the state of Utah. Okay, can anybody give me any evidence to support your claim that the, it's actually the earth going around the sun, not the sun going around the earth? Any of you give any evidence? If you can't give any evidence, then maybe we should go back to believing that it is the sun going around the earth. I mean, because that's what it looks like. When I look out my window, I, I don't feel that I'm moving. And I can see the sun moving. So we got some pretty good arguments here to believe that it's actually the sun going around the earth. And unless you can prove otherwise, I, maybe that's what I'll believe, wink, wink. Nothing? Just crickets? Is that all we're hearing here? Come on, somebody, provide me some evidence to back up your claim that I'm wrong here. Are you guys still there? Can somebody type yes in the chat board box? I'm getting worried that maybe nobody's there. Okay, good. All right. So you're there. Okay, that's good. But no. Okay, finally. So, okay. All right. So AJ is suggesting that the seasons might have something to do with it. Um, okay, shadows could maybe come in to help prove something. Okay, now we're starting to get some ideas. Good. I'm glad to see that. All right. So I'm going to take AJ saying now the seasons themselves you know, the fact that it gets warmer in the summer and colder in the winter, that actually doesn't really do it because I can think of a very good explanation for the seasons while, while the sun is still going around the earth. Uh, but I, I think you're, you're on the right track here. Uh, if you guys go outside tonight and you look up in the sky, you're gonna see some constellations. If you were to do the same thing six months from now, would you see the same constellations? No, you will see different constellations, okay? So this is something that we can work with here. So if you look at this model here, so this is what the flat earthers believe. So over on the right side here, we have this uh, thing that the flat earthers have even given it a name here. They, this, this, uh, this kind of like uh, uh, bubble around the earth, here, we call this the celestial sphere, okay? And so flat earthers would tell you that all of these stars that you see here, those are just little light bulbs that are attached to the celestial sphere. And the celestial sphere is the thing that's turning around us. And they would tell you that the sun 
is a great big light bulb that's attached to the celestial sphere. And then the moon is a, is a, is a big ball that's attached to the celestial sphere. And so the moon is, is illuminated by the sun there. Okay, So the fact that you see different constellations in the wintertime than you do in the summertime, that is very good evidence that my celestial sphere here, as I've got it drawn, cannot be true. The reason for that is because okay, if the sun was connected to the celestial sphere, and, and so the celestial sphere is rotating, then the stars that we see over here would be the only stars that we would ever see. They would never change um, because everything's rotating at the same time. So the only way that we can explain the fact that we see different stars in the wintertime than we do in the summertime is if the, the sun is not actually connected to the same sphere that the stars are. So what the flat earthers are going to say in response to that, they're going to say, okay, um, I can handle that. What we'll do is we'll just have one sphere that the stars are on, and we'll have a second sphere that the sun is on. And both of these spheres are rotating, but they're rotating at slightly different speeds. And so that explains why it is that in the wintertime we see some constellations, but in the summer we see different ones because the sun, the sun is rotating at a different speed than the stars do. And so you know, the, the stars we see at night are going to change as the year goes on. And we're gonna to have to do the same thing with the moon. We're gonna to have to say that we got a third sphere for the moon because sometimes the moon is illuminated like this. So we see a crescent, other times it's a full moon. So, so in, if we're gonna do this, we're gonna to have to have three spheres, one for the stars, one for the sun, one for the moon. So it's getting a little bit complicated. And so that, you know, the flat earthers are, you know, starting to not like this too much, but we can still explain all of the observations using this celestial sphere idea. Okay. Now, what about the planets? You guys know that the planets do some weird things. If you were to, if you were to go outside tonight, which by the way, I recommend you do it. Um, after it gets dark, you know, about an hour after the sun goes down, go outside tonight and look to the southeast and you will see two stars that are quite a bit brighter than the other stars. Well, they're not really stars. They're actually planets. So if you look to the southeast, you're going to see one star that's really bright. That one is Jupiter. And you're going to see another star really close to it that is also quite bright. And it's got kind of a reddish tint to it. Okay, That one is Mars. So they're not really stars. They're actually planets. So if you were to go outside tonight and you were to make a note of, let's just pick one of them. Let's just pick Jupiter. It's, it's the brightest one. So if you were to make note of where that star is relative to the background stars, so let's say that it's right there tonight, um, relative to background stars. If you were to go outside a week from now and look to see where is Jupiter relative to the background stars, you will see that, that well, first off, if you do it at the exact same time one week from now that you do tonight, you'll see that the entire sky will have shifted by just a little bit. But that's because the celestial sphere is rotating. But you'll see that Jupiter has shifted by a different amount. So if you were to map its position relative to the background stars, you'll find that it's actually over here. It will have moved a different amount than the background stars have moved. Okay. So the, the initial name for planets way back when, before people realized that they weren't really stars, they were, they were called the wandering stars, okay? And they, they were called this because people thought they were stars, but for some reason, they didn't move together with the rest of the stars. They moved at a different rate, and so they were called the wandering stars. All right, so some people say, all right, okay, flat earthers, how do you explain that? Well, the way that flat earthers explain it is they say, okay, uh, it looks like we're going to have to have a whole bunch of spheres, we're going to have to have one sphere for the stars. Okay, so this outer sphere here is the one. Let's let me do that in a different color. This outer sphere here is the one that has all the stars on it. 
And so then we're going to have to have one sphere for the sun, a different sphere for the moon, a different sphere for Venus, different sphere, all the different planets, they have all their different spheres. So we're starting to have an awful lot of spheres. Um, but my flat earth friends can still explain the motion uh, of the celestial objects and uh, based on the assumption that the earth is the center of everything. Okay, so all of these weird uh, observations that we've got here, they have not yet disproven the geocentric theory. We need something else to disprove the geocentric theory. And it has to be something that you yourselves could do without leaving the state of Utah. So anybody got any suggestions? How could you disprove the geocentric theory without leaving the state of Utah and without relying on photographs from NASA. Did none of you take the Mr. Ramsey's astronomy class? Some of you must have taken Mr. Ramsey's astronomy class. Nope. You guys are really quiet today. I'm getting worried. Ah, okay. So one student just said you're in it now. Okay. So has he talked about retrograde motion? Can anybody tell me what is, oh, he hasn't talked about it? Okay, I'm gonna have to wag my finger at him. Okay, so have you heard the term retrograde motion? Yeah. Okay, Can, do you have any idea what it is? Um, I think it has something to do with how Venus moves. Yeah, the planets, all of the planets, they, oh, they okay. all do it. Uh, uh, okay, so, Remember how I said that uh, if you go outside tonight and make a note of where Jupiter is relative to the background stars, you're going to find that it's going to move. Okay, so what you're seeing here is basically that. So, so let's start off by saying, okay, so ignore all these guys for right now. I'll talk about them in just a minute uh, and ignore this guy too. If you were to go outside tonight and look at where Jupiter is relative to the background stars, and let's suppose that it turns out to be right here. And so you see, we've got these other, two, these other two stars here and you see that Jupiter is pretty much in line with those other two stars. Okay, so that's what you see tonight. Now, the, the, what you're seeing here is just an example. I'm not claiming that Jupiter will be in line with these two stars tonight, this is just an example. Okay, so then let's suppose that we go out one week from now and we look to see where Jupiter is one week from now and we, and we find that it has moved. And so now, here it is. So plus one week, we'll, we'll find that Jupiter will have moved. And then if we go in another week, so now we're plus two weeks, we'll see that Jupiter has moved further relative to the background stars. Now, everything will have shifted, but Jupiter will have shifted by a different amount. Okay, so each of these dots that you see right here is Jupiter's position and we're assuming that it's uh, one week intervals here. And so what you see is that Jupiter is moving to the right at a constant speed, which is easy to explain using the sphere idea that we talked about, where I say that the, uh, the celestial sphere that Jupiter is on is, is rotating at a different speed than the one that the stars are on. But as time goes on, you'll see that something weird happens you'll see the dots start getting closer and closer together, which means Jupiter's speed is slowing down. And you'll reach a point right here where Jupiter stops moving to the right, and then it starts moving to the left, okay? So if you track Jupiter's path here, you'll find that it's moving to the right for a while, and then it stops, and then it moves to the left for a while. So this is what we call retrograde motion. And it only moves to the left for a little while and eventually stops and then it starts moving to the right again. Okay, so during this period here where it's going backwards, that's what we call retrograde motion. This is something that gives the flat earthers a problem. Because how do you explain that? So if we go back to our uh, geocentric theory here, the only way to explain that is to say that uh, the sphere that these planets are on. So I don't see I don't see Jupiter on my drawing here. So let's let's say it's Mars here. The only way to explain retrograde motion would be to say that the sphere that's Mars that Mars is on, the one that's rotating like this, 
that that sphere slows down and stops and starts spinning the other direction. And that's just too much to swallow. Even flat earthers were gonna say, nah, I can't believe that. So uh, it sounds like maybe we've got some evidence here that can disprove the geocentric theory, okay? But flat earthers are persistent if nothing else. Uh, and so they have actually found a way to explain retrograde motion that kind of sort of makes sense. Uh, in fact, there's one person whose name is Ptolemy, uh, and this is a name that I hope you've learned in your junior high school science class. It's, it's spelled with a P, but the P is silent. Okay, so this was way back, you know, like a thousand or more years ago. Uh, there was a, a guy who, he, this, the Flat Earth Society was not a society back at that time, but boy, if there was ever a, a member, somebody who would be the ideal member of the Flat Earth Society, Ptolemy would be it. He came up with a way to explain retrograde motion that would make flat earthers happy. Okay? What he said was, if you look at the planet, so let's suppose this is Mars. He is claiming that Mars is not directly attached to this sphere that's going around the Earth, but Mars is attached to another sphere, which is attached to the sphere. So he came up with these names. He called them epicycles and deference. So the deference sphere is rotating like this. And Mars is attached to a different sphere called the epicycle sphere, which has its center on the deference sphere. And so it's going around in a circle here at the same time that the deference sphere is going around in a circle. And so if you do that, you can see that it would look like Mars is going through a path like this. In fact, Mars would be going through a path like this. And during this region right here, you would see that Mars is moving backwards whereas over here it's moving forwards. And so by using these epicycle and deference spheres, Ptolemy was able to come up with a model that kind of sort of explained retrograde motion. Okay, so this is Ptolemy's model of the universe. Okay, so it's a complicated model. It's, it's not a metal model that flat earthers are especially happy with, but it, it kind of sort of works. It explains retrograde motion. Okay, so we still have not disproven the geocentric theory of the universe. Okay, so, uh, okay, so uh, Max, I see your question, but I hope you don't mind if I don't answer it right now because I don't want to go off on a tangent. Okay. So I, keep it in mind and later when class is over, I'd like to talk about it, but for right now. Okay, so I wanna go back and review what we did with the flat earth thing. How did we disprove the flat earth hypothesis? Well, we came up with something that we called a mathematical model. And then we looked to see, does the data fit the mathematical model? That's how scientists do science. And that's the reason why I spent so much time on the flat earth thing, because that's how science is done. And so that's what we're going to do now as well. So we are going to temporarily, for the sake of argument, we're going to assume that Ptolemy's model of the universe is correct. Okay, so we're going to say, okay, let's assume for a minute that Ptolemy's model is correct. And so we do have all of these spheres here that are called deference spheres, and they're rotating at some speed, and we could calculate what that speed needs to be. And then these epicycle spheres are spinning, so, so that's these guys. So they're moving at some speed. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a mathematical model. Okay, mathematical model of Ptolemy's theory for uh, what the universe looks like. Okay, so in our mathematical model, we would calculate how fast would Saturn's deference sphere have to be moving? How fast would Jupiter's deference sphere have to be moving? How fast would Saturn's epicycle sphere? So this is going to be a complicated model. And I do not intend to take the time right now to actually come up with the real model. It's not, it would not be useful uh, a way to spend our limited time. 
but it could be done. And in fact, Ptolemy did it. He came up with a mathematical model where he calculated what do each of these speeds need to be, okay? And, uh, and so everybody looked at his mathematical model and it had all these cal complicated calculations. They said, wow, sounds good to me, okay? And so because of Ptolemy's work for, for hundreds and hundreds of years, everybody said, okay, we believe the geocentric theory because Ptolemy's model looks like it does the job, okay? But here's the thing, if you really, really carefully track the positions of the uh, planets over time, okay, and you compare it to Ptolemy's, Ptolemy's model, does it in fact fit? Well, up until the time of a guy named Tycho Brahe, nobody had ever tracked the motion of the planets carefully enough to where they could really do a good comparison of the predictions of the mathematical model with the actual observed data. Nobody had tracked the planets carefully enough to do that. So a guy named Tycho Brahe came along and Tycho Brahe was really rich and he was really interested in the stars. So he had these incredible instruments constructed. So what you see right here is basically a huge protractor. And then he had a bunch of tubes that he, that he had inside of this huge protractor. And so he would sit here and he would look through the tubes and then he would measure the angles very, very carefully. And then he would have helpers who would write down all of the data. And so he would stay up at night, most nights for years and years. In fact, for pretty much the majority of his adult life, he would stay up at night measuring the planet's positions relative to the background stars with really high accuracy. And his assistants would all write it down. Now, one of his assistants was a guy named Johannes Kepler. Okay. Now, Tycho Brahe was very good at observing and taking measurements, but he wasn't really much of a mathematician. Johannes Kepler, on the other hand, he was an excellent mathematician. And so Johannes Kepler was able to take Tycho Brahe's data, and he was able to compare that with the predictions of the mathematical model uh, of Ptolemy's uh, theory of the universe, similar to the way that we did our comparison of the measured data for the altitude of Polaris as a function of distance from the North Pole. Okay. And so when, when Johannes Kepler did this, he found out that the data did not match, okay? So he was able to prove that the geocentric theory of the universe was wrong. And he did it very similar to the way that we, with the, we proved that the flat earth theory was wrong. And so this is really important because this is how science is done. You, you have a hypothesis, you create a mathematical model so you say, if the hypothesis is true, this is what the data should look like. And then you do a bunch of observations and then you see, does the data match, okay? And so in this case, we found out the data did not match. So we were able to say with confidence that the geocentric theory of the universe is wrong. Okay, so what we need now is some other theory to replace it. Uh, and so, uh, a lot of people said, well, okay, let's suppose that it's not the earth going around the sun. Let's suppose it's the sun, or I'm sorry, I say that I said that backwards. Okay, they, they said that in, instead of saying that the sun's going around the earth, let's suppose that the earth is going around the sun. All right, and so what they did was they said, okay, so here's the sun, and so here's the earth going around the sun and the other planets as well. And what they and so what Johannes Kepler did when he looked at that data was he found that it fits the data better. The, this this new this new hypothesis fit the data better, but it still didn't fit perfectly because this mod this new model that they came up with was assuming that the planets are moving in circular orbits. Okay. And so what Johannes Kepler found was that it fits the data better, but it still didn't fit as well as it should. So he had a problem. 
And so Johannes Kepler, he was a really good mathematician. So what he did was he played around with different shapes. So he said, okay, maybe if, maybe instead of assuming that it's a circle, let's assume that it's another shape here, a shape called an ellipse, okay, which is kind of like a flattened out circle. And so when he, when he modified the, the hypothesis to assume that the planets were moved in elliptical orbits, he found out that uh, the data fit a lot better. Okay, so, so we're getting closer, but it still didn't fit exactly right because he was assuming that the planets were moving at constant speed as it went around the ellipse. So then he said, okay, well, let's assume that, that they don't move at constant speed. Let's assume that the planets move faster when they're at the close position here and they move slower when at the far position. And, and, and so now the predictions are getting better. So, so what he's doing an incremental basically guess and check is what he's doing. And, and each time he makes these little adjustments, he finds out that the data fits better and better, okay? but he still didn't have perfect agreement, all right? So let's, let's take a minute and let's look at the, so what you're seeing here are Kepler's three laws. And so far we've only talked about his first two, okay? So Kepler's first modification was say, okay, let's assume then that the planets are moving in elliptical orbits. So that's Kepler's first law. Assume that they're, plan that they're moving in elliptical orbits where the sun, is at the focus point of the ellipse. Now, each ellipse has two focus points. You probably, you probably haven't talked about this yet in your math classes. Um, and if we have time left over at the end of the period, I'll talk about it a little bit more. But basically, uh, uh, an ellipse is a point where if you, if, you were to, if you were to take a string and you run, run a string around these two points here, and then you take your pen right here. And then what you do is you move your pen over here and you always keep your pen as far away from these two points as you can. And, but the string limits on how far you can go. So when you get over here, okay, you, you take your pen as far away as you can, but the string limits how far you can go. So if you were to path, trace this point here, trace this path here, and you move your pen keeping it as far away as the string will allow you to go, what you'll find is that you have an ellipse. And these two points here, those are the focus points of the ellipse. All right, so Kepler assumed that the planets are moving in elliptical orbits and that the sun was located at one of the focus points. And he found that by making that assumption, the data fit a lot better, but it still wasn't perfect. So then he said, okay, so let's assume that when the planets are close, they're moving faster. And when the planets are further away, they're moving slower, okay? And he came up with a very, uh, very mathematical way of, of saying that. So when you look in the book tonight, before you do the homework, because I know you always read the book before you do the homework, right? You're gonna find that Kepler's second law is not worded the way that I just worded it. It's worded in a different way. Basically what it says is if you were to take a line and you connect the sun and the planet at some point, and then you wait a little while and let the planet move. And during that time, you look at the area that's swept out by this line that connects the two. So what you have now is a piece of pizza. So if you look at the area of this piece of pizza that's formed when the, when the planet is close to the sun, and then you wait a couple months, and then you do the same thing again when the planet is further away from the sun. And you look at the area that's swept out by this imaginary line here. What Kepler said is that the area of this long skinny piece of pizza is going to be the same as the areas of this short fat piece of pizza. Now that's a kind of a funny way to do it. I mean, if, you're, if your goal is to say that the planets move faster when they're close here and they move slower when they're further away. Wording it in terms of areas of pieces of pizza is a kind of a funny way to do it, unless you're good at math. If you're good at math, then it's actually a very good way to do it. 
because Kepler was good at calculating the areas of pizzas of pieces of pizza. And so if you if that's the case, what you can do is you can say that if you know the if if you know the velocity at this point and you know this distance, so you know v1 and d1, and if you know how to calculate areas of pieces of pizza, then over here, when the planet is at a further distance, so let's call that D2, you could then calculate exactly how much slower it'd be. You could calculate what V2 is, okay? Now, in your homework tonight, we're not gonna ask you to do this. So if you're thinking to yourself, well, I don't know how to calculate the area of a piece of pizza, don't worry. We're not gonna ask you to do it. I just want you to be aware that that's how it adds done. So if you've got these four variables, D1, V1, D2, V2, if you know any three, it's then possible to calculate the fourth. And so Kepler's second law is, fr is framed in, in terms of that, okay? And, and he found that when he did this, then he got the data to fit much, much better. But he still needed one last adjustment in order to get the data to fit really well. So that last adjustment is this one that you see right here, okay? And this is the one that most of your homework problems are gonna be about tonight. And this is Kepler's third law. Okay, so first we need to make some, uh, some definitions. Okay, so we have to define something that's called the period of a planet's motion. All right, so if, and it's very much like the period of a pendulum that we talked about before. If you were to start your clock when the planet is right here, and then you wait while the planet goes around, and then when the planet comes back to its original point, that's when you stop the clock. So the amount of time that it takes to do that is what we call the period, and we're going to use a capital T to represent that. So lowercase t stands for any old time. So when we're doing calculations, whenever we use a lower class t, lower case t, that just means any old time. When we use an uppercase t, that means one very special time. That is the period. All right, so if we talk about the period of planet A, then okay, that's good. But let's assume now that we have another pl planet that is further away. All right, and so it's going to have a period too. So we're going to call that the period of planet B. All right, so what you see in this equation right now, T, A, T, B, that's what those are. Those are the periods of two different planets that are orbiting the same sun. All right, now, what is this R, A, and R, B? Well, that is the average distance. So if you look just at planet A here, so let's assume this is planet A. So you can see right here, the planet is really far away from the sun, whereas over here, the planet is really close to the sun. So what we're going to do is we're just going to average it out. So over the course of the whole year, we get a whole bunch of different distances here. If we would take the average of all of those over the course of the year, that's what we're going to call RA. Okay, and then we'll do the same thing for planet B, the average distance of planet B, we're going to call it RB. Okay, so Kepler, by using his first law and his second law, he got it to where his mathematical model was really close to predicting the actual uh, observed um, uh, data that Tycho Brahe had collected, but it wasn't quite perfect until he finally made this last assumption here. And he didn't just come with that right from the very beginning. He did it by trial and error. So what he did was he, he played around with a couple ideas. So he said, what if I were to take the period of planet A divided by the period of planet B? And let's see, is that equal to the average distance of planet A divided by the average distance of planet B? And so he made that mathematical guess, and then he checked that against all of Tycho Brahe's data, and he found out, nope, that didn't work, doesn't fit the data. So then he said, well, okay, what if I try taking the period of the planets, and let's try squaring those. Does that fit? Nope, didn't fit. Okay, well, let's try squaring this. Nope, that didn't fit. So he just kept on playing with the data. It's totally by trial and error. 
Uh, and then when he finally tried this combination right here, he said, all right, let's try squaring the period and cubing the data. All of a sudden, yay, okay? All of a sudden the data fit. Now here's the thing. He arrived at this by trial and error. So Johannes Kepler never really understood why it was that when he, when, he, when he took TA over TA squared and he compared that with RA over RB cubed and he saw that they were equal, he never knew why it worked. It was just, he, he just arrived at it by trial and error, okay? And so it did work. And once he made this final assumption, then everything fell into place. Now all of a sudden, the predictions of his mathematical model fit the observed data that Tycho Brahe had collected. And so we now finally have a mathematical model that actually works. Okay. Even though Tycho, even though Kepler never really understood why it worked. And by the way, that really bugged him. Even on his deathbed, one of his greatest regrets is he never knew why it was that his equations worked. He only knew that they did. Okay. Now, Today, we don't have time to go through and explain why they worked, but next time we will. Um, we're going to derive Kepler's third law, but not today. We, we don't have time to do it today. So for now, we'll just take it on faith. All right, so now let's work through a couple problems like you're gonna see in your homework tonight. All right, so one problem that you might see is you'll say that, okay, so let's suppose that this right here is the earth, Okay, and we're going to assume that uh, the astronomers, uh, they discover a new planet that somehow they had never seen before. And let's suppose that this new planet is closer to the sun than ours is. And so what they do then is they watch this new planet over a period of a long time, you know, many months, maybe even many years. And what they can do is they can measure what the period of this new planet is. So let's call this new planet, planet N, where N stands for new, All right? So if the astronomers watch it over a long enough period, what they can do is they can measure the period of this new planet. And so let's suppose that they discovered the, the period of this new planet is, oh, I don't know, how about 0 0.7 years, 0 0.7 Earth years. Okay, so in your homework tonight, they're going to ask you, how far away from the sun is this new planet? And I propose by using Kepler's third law, you can answer that question. So Kepler's third law says that if you have two planets that are orbiting the same sun, you can use Kepler's third law to, uh, to figure some things out. Now, one of the planets is the, the Earth. So let's see, what do we know about the Earth? Do we know what the period of the Earth is? What, how long does it take for the Earth to go around the sun? Anybody know how much, how much that is? Nobody wants to say anything here? 365 days. 365 days, right. Or we also could call it one year as well. 365 and one fourth, you're right. Okay. How about if instead of calling it 365 days, Let's just call it one year, because when we put the numbers into the equation here, if we take 300, 365 squared, that's going to give us a really messy number. But if we take one squared, one squared is one. So I'm proposing that the problem is going to be a lot easier if instead of using, instead of working in days, let's work in years. And so by definition, the period of the Earth is one year. Okay, now, if we're going to use this equation, we're, going to, we're also going to need to know how far is the Earth away from the Sun. Anybody know how far away from the, uh, the Sun the Earth is? You know, some of you might say, well, I remember 93 million miles. That sounds about right. So we could do that. What we could do is we, we could use 93 million miles as the distance, but again, 93 million miles cubed, that's gonna be a really messy number. 
So I'm proposing let's define a new unit of measurement. Let's define the average distance of the Earth from the Sun and define that to be one astronomical unit. Okay, so this is a unit that we're going to make up and we're doing it in order to make the math really easy. So by definition, an astronomical unit is the average distance of the Earth away from the Sun. Okay, so that means that if I take Kepler's third law, or so I'm going to write it in terms of Tn and Te rather than Ta and Tb. So what I'm going to say is that the period, oops, hang on a second here, I'm getting, okay, got it. Okay, so I'm going to say that the period of this new planet divided by the period of the planet Earth squared is equal to the distance of this new planet divided by the distance of the Earth cubed, oops, not squared, cubed. Okay, and by picking my units the way that I have makes the math really easy because the period of the planet Earth, the way I've defined it is one and the distance of the planet Earth, the way I've defined it is one. So I can just ignore those. Right, so that's going to make life really easy. So let me clear off some space here so that I can have a little room to work here. Okay, so then what I'm going to get is the period of the new planet uh, squared. So that's going to be 0 0.7 squared and it's 0 0.7 divided by one, but uh, I can ignore the one, okay, equals the period of the new planet cubed divided by one and, and anything divided by one is just one. So that's, or I'm sorry, did I say period? I meant distance, okay? So that means that the distance of the new planet cubed is equal to the period of the new planet squared, okay? So I'm thinking we can solve this pretty easy. So if I want to uh, get rid of the cube there, what I have to do is I have to take the cubed root so if I take the cubed root of that, then cubed root cancels cube, and I'm just left with R nu. But whatever I do the left side, right side, I have to do the same thing left side. So there we go. So the cubed root of 0.7 squared, that will be the average distance of the new planet. See how it works? Okay, now I do have a little bit of a problem here. Hopefully you guys can help me out. When I look on my calculator, I see a square root sign. I don't see a cubed root sign. Hmm, somebody help me out. How can I take the cubed root if I don't see a cubed root button on my calculator? Well, I do see a button that says math. Okay, so good, I see. So you guys are suggesting two different methods here. Okay, so one method is if I push the button that says math, then I see a bunch of options that pop up. And one of those options is in fact cubed root. Okay, so it is in my calculator is just hidden. Okay, but it's there. Okay, but some of you have suggested that, hey, there is still another way that we could do it. Even if I didn't have a cubed root button on my calculator. Okay, so some of you are recognizing that x so the cubed root of x is the same thing as x to the one third power. And you are absolutely right. Okay, so what would the cubed root of x squared be? Well, that would be x to the two thirds power. Okay, so if you are aware of this rule of mathematics, then that'll work. So what we can do is we can just take, we can take 0.7 and raise that to the two thirds power. But be careful in your calculator. If you type 0.7 raised to the two divided by three, you will get the wrong answer because what your calculator will do is it'll take 0.7 raised to the second power and it'll take that number and it'll divide that number by three. That's the way the calculators work. So if you want to type it in this way, make sure that you put two thirds in parentheses. Otherwise you'll get the wrong answer, okay? Uh, and then those of you that prefer to do it the other way, uh, you can do it the other way. 
So what you can do is you can use, go to your calculator and go to math and then use the cubed root function and take the cubed root of 0.7 squared and that'll give you the right answer. So let me just see what that works out to be. So, so if I do that, I go to the cubed root of 0.7 squared. And so the answer I get is 0.788. So this then is the average distance of my new planet here. Okay. Now that distance is going to be in the same units. They're going to be in astronomical units. So it's not going to be in meters, not going to be in miles. It's going to be in astronomical units. So this new planet that we discovered, we now know that it is its average distance away from the sun is 0.788 times whatever Earth's distance is. Okay, so Aubrey, or I'm sorry, oh, oh, yeah, well, too late, I've already laid. Okay, so Aubrey just asked the question, she says, how do you know that Earth is planet B and not planet A? Answer is it doesn't matter. You can, you can let them be whatever you want, okay? Try it, try it both ways. You, you can call it planet A and then, and then the other one is planet B or you can call Earth planet B and the other one's planet A, doesn't matter. You'll get the same answer. Okay, so uh, that's pretty much it for today. Uh, your homework for tonight, I'm gonna keep it pretty simple because I realize that uh, I've hit you with a lot of new material here. Uh, it's a, a lot to digest in one sitting. So your homework here, let me just, uh, well, you can look on, you can look on Canvas and see what it is on Canvas, but just uh, for completeness. Okay, so here it is. So I'm only, whoops, why did it do that? Oh, all right. So I'm only giving you five problems and they are quite easy problems. It's not like last time where I gave you three hard problems. This time I'm giving you five easy problems. Make sure that you read the book before you do the homework. Okay, you really need to read the book. It does a good job of explaining the things that I just explained. Okay. All right. Any questions? All right, if not, you can go ahead and type bye into the chat box. Um, and if you do have a question and you are just waiting for me to turn off the recording so you could ask a question without being embarrassed, I will go ahead and turn off the recording now.